In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Assalamu alaikum, my dear respected viewers, and welcome to the second episode of the Islamic Expansion Series here on Current Events. As always, I'm your host, Ali Jassim. In the previous episode, we discussed with our dear guest, Sheikh Muhammad al hilli the expansion of the Islamic religion in general. However, in this episode, we will speak about the expansion of the Shia Islam, the sect that was found by Emir al-Mu'minin and the Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. Stay tuned, dear viewers, as we answer questions like, if we were to compare the population of Shia Muslims with the Sunni Muslims, in the guest's opinion, which one will grow faster than the other? And which sect in Islam is growing faster every day? Is it the authentic Islam, which was established by the Prophet Muhammad and his holy household, or is it the deviant sect, which was established by the Saqifah and Antullah alayhim? Here to discuss these issues and many more is my dear guest, he is a prominent Islamic preacher and teacher of Islamic studies at a number of universities in the West, Sheikh Muhammad al hilli Stay with us, dear viewers. Assalamu alaikum once again, dear respected viewers. Welcome to the second uh, episode of the Expansion of Islam series. In this episode, we will discuss the expansion of Shia Islam here with my guest, Sheikh Muhammad al hilli Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Sheikh, let's begin with this first uh, question. If we were to compare the population of the Shia Muslims with the Sunni Muslims, in your opinion, which one will grow faster than the other? And is the birth rate the only factor is that is increasing in the followers of a religion or can other factors play a role in this equation? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah the most compassionate the most merciful the comparison between the different schools of thought as far as their numbers has been the subject of uh, discussion and some research recently well, we find some of the research organizations have, such as Pew International Research and others, Pew Research Center, have suggested that the, the percentage, so to speak, for the Shia population in the world is 10 to 15 percent of the Muslim Ummah of the Muslim countries or the Muslim population around the world. And the Sunni approximately 80 to 85 percent. However, in uh, reality, we find there are flaws and problems with this particular estimate because in our own research and the research conducted by other organizations, it seems that the number at least is 25% of the Muslim world that are following the school the of Ahl al-Bayt, the Shia. And uh, today, what we find with regards to the numbers so to speak I mean the, the, one of the reasons for this is of course the large number of the Shias that are present in Iraq in Iran in Bahrain in Lebanon in Pakistan in Saudi Arabia Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia in uh, places and also the uh, rising number in the West as well uh, in Europe and in Americas um, you find a good number of Shias there and you find a very uh, similar percentage in these countries as well 20% of the Muslims so to speak but in my opinion having studied the last maybe 10-15 years and what has happened there is absolutely no doubt that the Shias are being targeted and killed much more than the Sunnis nobody can can even estimate or can compare that because you look at the countries like we have mentioned like Iraq like in Syria like for example in Saudi like in Bahrain like in Pakistan the number one targets are the Shia they're the most oppressed they're the, most the most oppressed the most executed and tortured and killed and so on and so forth and therefore despite having despite this however uh, and we don't have international figures and research to support this claim but we can say from 
the evidence, anecdotal evidence that we have gathered from different parts of the world, that the number of the Shias is definitely increasing at a higher rate than the number of Sunnis. And the reason for that is because of the a number of factors. It is not certainly about birth rate because birth rate could be argued to be quite similar in countries which are Shia as well as countries which are non-Shia in the Muslim world. However, today we have the ease by which the teachings of the school of Ahl al-Bayt is being presented to the world. We have the internet, we have satellite channels, we have publications which are easily being distributed more and more. So for example, in Northern Africa, in countries such as Tunisia, in countries such as Morocco, in Egypt, we find the increase in the number of Shias, considerable increase. We find even in places where the Shias are heavily persecuted, like in Saudi, the satellite channels and the debates that have taken place and the ease, because if you, if, you, if you think about it, if we go back maybe 15, 20 years time, if you have a, a, a Sunni who is sitting at home and is wondering who the Shias are, what are their teachings? I've heard about them. They may be a friend or somebody is a Shia, but I'm not comfortable to go and ask them what is their aqidah, what is their true belief. They are restricted unless they go and buy a book. If they are in a country where Shia books are banned, and that is the case in many countries today, because they realized the, the problems they're facing with the expansion of the Shia ideology. And there have been many of these Salafi, Wahhabi ideology teach, uh, scholars, so to speak, or preachers who have come out on, te on television, on, you see them on these YouTube, they have gone crazy. They say the Shia is spreading, we have yeah. to stop it. They fear, the they fear, yes. One of them was so angry, began to hit the pulpit that oh, he was, yeah. and he wanted to do this, 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 this very, very shouting. And, because it's the frustration, they see it, they know it as well. They know it's coming. They know it's happening. So this individual, 20 years ago, may find difficulty and then give up. Today it takes him or her one minute, go online, on the internet, and search. Switch on the television, and there are many Shia satellite channels that yes. many people around the world can obtain as well. So the availability of Shia belief now and the aqidah and the lectures from Shia ulama and the material that is present, the Shia books that is present online has made that much more accessible for the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world, by the way, mm -hmm. um, to, to accept Shia Islam. Uh, in this, in this uh, few days, I'm here in the holy city of Karbala and with me there's a brother who's from America and he first embraced Islam as he does uh, and, and he chose the path of uh, the school of Khilafah. And then after maybe one or two years, because of the accessibility of this information, he was introduced to the school of Ahl al-Bayt and alhamdulillah today he's a Shia. Okay. So the key thing is, it's a, it's, um, it is something that we find more and more prevalent today and that is the expansion of the Shia numbers. And I tell you, this is the reason why you have people working extra hard to cause damage to Shia numbers. So they plant bombs, they execute, they kill and so on. They think that by doing that, people like Daesh and their supporters and uh, Wahhabism, they think that, okay, the number is increasing. The best way we can do is to kill more. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, what this is also doing is people are asking a question, why is Shia has been targeted? Because the more they are targeted, the more people are wondering, there must be you know, some truth about them that they are peaceful, they themselves are not killing others. So what is the reason? And that is also leading to more questions being presented, more research, yes. more investigation. And from my experience, many of the Shia, and I don't want to generalize, but many of the Shia scholars are much more open to questions and happy to sit in dialogue and discussion and people are discovering that whereas in some uh, schools of thought they close the door on thought and that's the you know babul ijtihad the, the ability to uh, develop this um, extrapolation of laws from the quran and the sunnah whereas other schools of thought they're more stagnant and they're saying no no for example don't ask this question let's not go into details There's so no they stimulated yeah no. yeah so they have we have stimulated thought and have encouraged development 
and our uh, for progression and for the answering of people's queries and questions. Yes, Sheikh. Can the ideology of the followers of Saqifa and Wahhabism bring peace to the world? Or will the Islam of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and his true Shia followers bring peace to the world? This is an obvious question, but... Yeah. Well, <coughs> today, if we were to explain to the respected viewer, what are we talking about when it comes to these two ideologies? We are talking about one system which is purely based on violence, rejection of the other, the killing of the other, the forcing of the belief on their throats, otherwise there will be severe punishment and consequences. The image that is very backward and which is very uh, distorted of Islam. On the other hand, we have the Islam of peace, the Islam of love, the Islam of development, the Islam of knowledge, the Islam of taqwa and spirituality, and that is the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam. So there is no doubt that today when the world n witnesses the atrocities and the uh, terrorist actions, they are waking up to this reality. You look at 9-11, it was perpetrated by the supporters of Wahhabism. You look at in 7-7 in the United Kingdom, the bombings that took place on the underground on the buses. It was perpetrated and committed by people of the ideology of Wahhabism and this takfiri mentality, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, Taliban, all the same mm -hmm. in, that, in that ideology. All of them come back to this particular uh, establishment of this ideology, which is Salafi Wahhabi. If you look at what has happened in Paris, if you look at what is happening in Iraq with ISIS and Daesh, you look at what happened in Belgium, all these have a common denominator, and that is Wahhabism. And so the world is not like, oh, one of them is an example and the others. That is why today the, the position of the school of Ahl al-Bayt and the Maraja and our ulama has been to present us ourselves with our true identity and that is the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon them. We are the Shia of the Ahl al-Bayt because the moment people realize that we are in that particular category, we are followers of these holy individuals that propagated the message of tolerance, the message of respect, the message of love, mm -hmm. the message of peace. And this uh, is very crucial in this day and age because there have been a number of misconceptions and uh, very much a confused state in the minds of non-Muslims and others as well when they see someone saying Allahu Akbar and beheading when they see someone with a beard holding a Quran and this and that and so on and so forth and so it even for the Shias today again it pr pr provides them with a great opportunity to speak to people about the wonderful personalities of the Ahl al-Bayt to really show their true love and devotion to the Ahl al-Bayt by speaking to individuals and propagating the madhab in the right manner. Imam al-Rida would say to us as a clear message he says, Ahyu amrana rahimallahu man ahya amrana. Revive our affairs. May God's mercy and blessings be upon the ones who revive our affairs. And the, he was asked how he would respond to ta'allamuna ulumana. You learn our teachings. But the Ahl al-Bayt, this wealth, this amazing treasure of knowledge. وَتُعَلِّمُونَ هَالنَّاسِ And then you teach it to the people. فَإِنَّ النَّاسَ لَوْ عَلِمُوا مَحَاسِنَ كَلَامِنَا لَتَّبَعُونَ Imam gives us all a guarantee. If people were to hear us, to hear what we have to so offer, understand. They, and to understand, they would follow us. Mm -hmm. It's in the fitrah to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ones whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us as the leaders after the Holy Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon them all. So the distinction today must be made between the Islam of the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt and the so-called hijacked Islam of Bani Umayyah. The Islam of those who have taken the rights from the Ahl al-Bayt The ones who have taken their haq, the ones who have oppressed the Ahl al-Bayt. 
the Islam of Bani Abbas, this and the Islam of Taliban and ISIS and Daesh. This distinction must be made in order for people to have an understanding of the true teachings of the beautiful religion. Yes, mashallah. Thank you for that, Sheikh. Will the growth of the Shia Muslims population and publicizing the true Islam, which was preserved through Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Imam Hussein, peace be upon them, improve the life conditions of the people in the Western world? Why? There are so many areas we can talk about that the Ahlul Bayt have given us guidelines and instructions and teachings to really uplift our physical and spiritual presence in this world before the Akhirah, of course. First thing we have to say is the Quran is the constitution for the well-being and the happiness of human beings in this world and in Akhirah. Now, who understands the Quran? Who can interpret the Quran? Who can provide us with the correct teachings of the Quran? I give you one example. We have verses in the Quran, which if it's taken out of context, is used by terrorists to perpetrate and commit crimes. Chapter 9, verse number 5. Kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. If people do not have the right guidelines, the right guidance, the right instructions and leadership, then they will definitely go astray. And this was predicted by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in a hadith which is mutawatir, lafzi, in other words, the exact term was used by the Holy Prophet in Sunni and Shia narrations. You find that he says, "Inni tarikum fikum ma antamassaktum bihima lan tadlu baadi abda." I leave for you two things. If you hold on to them strongly, you will never go astray. Kitab Allah wa atrati ahl baiti. They are my book and my progeny, the Ahl al-Bayt. They will not separate. They are inseparable until they meet me on the pond of Kothar on the day of judgment. So that means the Ahl al-Bayt and the Quran are hand in hand. That means the Quran can only be understood by the Ahl al-Bayt. That means the Ahl al-Bayt are the manifestations of the Quran. They are the walking Quran. Amir al muminin says, Ana al -Quran un -natiq. I am the Quran that speaks. So you look at examples in history. You look at one after the other of how the Ahl al-Bayt demonstrated these values that we need today. Today there is so much injustice. Today there is so much crime. Today there is so much lawlessness. You come and you find that the United Na Nations in uh, uh, 2002 had produced the document with regards to the rulership in the Arab world. And they have used the example of the letter of Amir al muminin that is found in Nahj al-Balagha to Malik al-Ashtar. And you find them talking about how Amir al muminin demonstrated this magnificent values of justice and adala. You find Christian authors like George Jodak, he's written this famous book, Ali, Sawt al-Adala al-Insaniyya, Ali, this voice of human justice. Now, when he talks about Amir al muminin and his principles, it truly is an exemplary nature for all of us to follow. That today in the world which is gripped with injustice, we need to look at the justice of Amir al-Mu'mineen, peace be upon him. And with the Ahl al-Bayt we understand their mercy. In this world which is now full of hatred, mm -hmm. Amir al-Mu'mineen, just for examples for the, for the, for the respected viewers to, to, to appreciate, in the battlefield in Safin, Amir al-Mu'mineen has no water with his army. And they are pleading with the, or asking the army of Muawiyah to give them water. They would not. Now, we are talking about thousands of soldiers. Imam alayhi salam charges to front and takes control of the water. Now, his companions are saying, we do the same for Muawiyah. Amir Mu'mini says, no. We feed them water. But you feed your own enemies water? Yes, even in their horses, even in their animals. Same for Imam Hussein alayhi salam on, in Karbala. He feeds the army of Al-Hur who had come to force him not to go to Kufa. He feeds him themselves individually. In his holy hands, he feeds them water. Such was the mercy and the love. Such was the thinking of altruism and self-sacrifice. You look at Sayyidatul Nisa, Fatima al Zahra, peace and blessings be upon her. Such an honorable lady who, example after example of her life, that she would give away anything that she had to the poor and the needy. 
The Quran demonstrates this. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا Three consecutive days they were fasting. They give the entire food to the poor, desperately poor, to the orphan, to the captive. Yet at the same time, what do you find? You find that these individuals, they lived the simplest of lives. And they had the highest morality. Their akhlaq was superb. And God has chosen them. And for us today, when it comes to advances in knowledge, we can seek inspiration from them. When it comes to how to get close to Allah, spirituality, we can learn from them. We can, when it even comes to political governance, justice and equity and other th matters, we can certainly seek guidance from them. All the facets of life, they are a wealth of information and knowledge they are the ship of salvation that we invite people, invite ourselves even to investigate further and to delve de deeper and to be illuminated and for our hearts and our souls to be purified with taking them as the role model. And that's why the Quran tells us قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى that the Prophet of Islam says just show love and respect and following of my family and you'll see the real positive change that will happen in the surroundings. Last question, is it fair to say that the ideology of the Shia Muslims is based on, lo on logic and makes perfect sense? In your opinion, what are the most effective methods to publicize the teachings and traditions of Prophet Muhammad and his household, peace be upon them, to the whole world? You know, this way people would get familiar with the true religion of Islam and the open-minded would revert to this religion. Absolutely correct. I would say that this uh, school of thought, the school of the Ahl al-Bayt, is one that has emphasized on the role of the aql and the intellect. And today there are many who would want to see that role being played, uh, that function, that faculty being demonstrated. Because too often on the other side it has been ignored and people don't understand. They don't, why should women be uh, banned from driving, for example? What is the reason there is no aql behind it in Saudi for example you look at the school of Ahl al-Bayt no doubt it is rational in its deduction and it's certainly compatible with this day and age with the challenges that are being faced and we are alhamdulillah being able to provide the answers to modern day problems and difficulties but starting from day one after the sad wafat and shahad of the Prophet we find that from that time, the role of the intellect was very much emphasized. In that, if we talk about, for example, how a, such a prominent individual like the Holy Prophet, who has come for the final and the greatest of um, uh, messages, and that's the religion of Islam, the teachings and the religion, would leave this world without having somebody who would carry on the message. I just narrate you this story, which is a very important story, just to illustrate the role of aql, the role of intellect and rationality. That in Saudi, there was once in a book shop, there's people buying books, there was a Shia scholar. He was trying to buy some books. And the keeper, the bookshop owner came to him and said to him, I realize that you are a Shia and I have a problem with your madhab. So the Shia scholar said, what is the problem with our madhab? He said, the problem is you exaggerate the day of Ghadir. The day of Ghadir, you think it's big Eid and you celebrate and you make it too big. It is just the day where the Prophet said, Ali is my friend. Oh. Nothing like <laughs> this. So the Shia scholar said, I am happy to sit down with you and we present evidence and I show you how, for example, over 300 Sunni scholars have demonstrated the significance of this day and have narrated what has happened and how we can prove that the word Mawla here doesn't mean friend but complete authority. As the Quran says, The Prophet has authority over the believers more than they have over themselves. Mm -hmm. themselves. And so on. I could present you with this evidence and we can discuss because our, relig our faith is the religion and the teachings of dialogue. Imam al-Sadiq would sit days and months with atheists 
And they say, oh, we don't believe in God. They say, okay, let me prove to you. He did not hold a, a sword on them and say, you must become Muslim. Yes. That's not our matter. Our teachings is not like that. So, this uh, scholar said, let us sit down now and we discuss. The shopkeeper said to him, okay, let put, uh, let's put a diary date tomorrow sometime. We sit somewhere and we have a debate, discussion. The Shia scholar said, I have one shart, one condition. Mm -hmm. What is that? He said, the condition is we do this discussion now. Now, now, this moment. We sit somewhere and we have a debate. The shopkeeper of the bookstore said, I cannot. Why? He said, because I am the keeper of this store. And if I go to somewhere, sit in the room, and to have a debate with you about Eid al-Ghadir, the shop itself will be empty. There is nobody to sell the books. How can I leave the shop without having somebody to look after it? This is the role of Aqal. The Shia said to him, look, you are having a shop with books and you do not want to leave it without somebody to sell the books. And you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take the soul of the Prophet and leave Muslims without appointing somebody to lead them? So you can see that he made him think. I have just a few books, but I'm, I don't have someone to look after, so I don't want to go and have a debate. But you want the whole religion, the Prophet, to leave this world and say, okay, you choose shura, whatever you want, and they did in Saqifa, and the disasters that happened. The key thing is, Today, if we think rationally, and the ones who have embraced the school of Ahl al-Bayt are the ones who have gone back to the aql and intellect. They are the ones who have find, found their ability to rationalize arguments and to present proof and to be able to think, not just to follow. Oh, but this and that, but I'll be in trouble. No, no, free your mind. Look at the facts. Look at the, the, the reality of what has happened. How can I be following individuals that came openly and said the Prophet of Islam has lost his mind, has become delirious in Nahu la yahjur? How can I be following individuals and not following others who were the main people in the battlefield like Amir al-Mu'mineen? Not, never go back. Yes? Karrar ghayr farrar Amir al-Mu'mineen. Whereas others, they would go back. Yeah? How can I be not following an individual who the Prophet of Islam said, Ali yun ma al haq wal haqqu ma Ali. Truth is with Ali and Ali is with the truth. But the truth revolves around Ali, not the other way around. Yes? How can I not be following an individual? According to Sahih Muslim, that the, the Imam himself, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says, Kanat li manzilatan inda Rasulillah this manzila, this, I, this position that I had with the Holy Prophet, no one else had. Yes? Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Ali Baba. Hundreds of narrations that highlight the maqam and the status of the commander of faithful. All intellect. If we sit and think for a moment, we're able to appreciate the superiority and the haq, which is quite evident. So today, no doubt. Today, this is something that we have to be using and certainly more and more people are discovering and finding out. Thank you so much for that, Sheikhna. Brothers and sisters, this concludes the second episode of the Islamic Expansion series. Be sure to stay tuned for the third episode, which we will discuss our role to um, expand this uh, faith. Thank you, dear viewers, for watching, and we thank our dear guest, Sheikh Muhammad Hali, for joining us once again, and thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh.